Okay, so thanks for doing the new experimentation with the uh, introductions. Uh, I'm personally very excited about the topic today and the speakers. Um, so there's two today. First is Timothy Spine, Tim not Spine, sorry, Timothy Stein, and he is a licensed marriage and family therapist since 1999. He has worked in a variety of clinical settings and have his, so maybe we could end the introduction part and focus up here, thank you. Um, Having found this his professional passion, treating sex addiction, he has become a certified sex addiction therapist supervisor and a certified partner specialist. Tim is also trained in post-induction therapy, trauma resource modeling, and EMDR. He is dedicated to helping people recover from sex addiction and provides information via presentations, interviews, and blogs. When not providing hope, healing, and guidance around sex addiction, Tim can be found playing bass in a local rock and blues band. While he is a key member of the band's musical backbone, by popular demand, Tim is not given a microphone. <laughs> the second speaker is Jeannie Vitoni, and she has been a licensed, she is a licensed clinical social worker since 1998 and has helped those affected by traumatic experiences for 20 plus years. She has worked in school systems, child protective services, private foster care, critical response to natural disasters, and private practice focusing on trauma and addiction. Jeannie is a certified sex addiction therapist supervisor as well, and also a certified clinical partner specialist supervisor. She's also trained in EMDR. Jeannie embraces the trauma model for her work with partners as well as addicts, and often speaks in the community about sex addiction and the trauma model. Jeannie is passionate about her work as well as her family. In addition, she enjoys organic gardening, fostering animals with the Humane Society of Sonoma County, and hiking through the beautiful hills of Sonoma County. Together, in, in 2012, Tim and Jeannie founded Willow Tree Counseling, an outpatient treatment program for sex addicts, their partners, and families in Santa Rosa. Willow Tree Counseling provides treatment through individual, group, and family and couples therapy, as well as educational seminars and therapeutic workshops. So thank you. So my name is Jeannie Vitoni, and wow, that was a really great intro, so I don't have to say as much. Um, as, as you just heard, I've been doing trauma work for a very long time, and Tim and I actually started working together in probably 2009, and really started going 2010, and then um, started exclusively working with partners and addiction probably 12, and then incorporated and now have clinicians who are working with us and training with us in this field. Um, that's a little side note of we're also looking for someone who might be interested in doing more work with addicts in the sex addiction problematic sexual behavior world. So if it's something that's of interest to you, please reach out to us. Um, as stated, we work with individuals, uh, addicts and partners. We run groups for both partners and addicts. And we do recovery um, couples work. The type of recovery couples work is very different than traditional couples work. So we'll be talking more about that today. Um, our presentation today is kind of divided into two parts. Tim will be talking about the addiction and um, neurological pieces, and then I'll be talking about the partner and the trauma model and what partners go through. I'm Tim Stein. I'm so glad you're here. Um, I love doing presentations on sex addiction and the impact that it has on the addict as well as the partners. It's my passion professionally, uh, and I'm always happy to share it. So I'm so glad that you're here. The, like Jeannie said, we're going to talk about sex addiction, the neurological piece, how it uh, plays out when we think about the treatment, and then we're going to talk about partners, uh, the neurological impact of the trauma that they have experienced, and how that plays out in treatment for the partner as well as for the couple. So, let's start with what is sex addiction? Sex addiction is an unhealthy relationship to a sexual behavior relationship or person that changes the way that you feel. Like an alcoholic has an unhealthy relationship with alcohol, a sex addict has an unhealthy relationship with sex. I always want to make a comment here, which is that for sex addicts, when they're in their addiction, the relationship they have with their partner is with their partner as an object to give them an addictive high. So while a sex addict may be in a relationship, and a sex addict may have a lot of sex in that relationship. For the partner, it is typically a very lonely place to be 
because they are being treated and related to not as an individual person in an intimate way, but as an object to be used as an addictive high. So I just want to always point that out. So when we're talking about sex addiction, sex addiction, sex addiction is, 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 not a, is not defined by how outside of the norm is the behavior. So sex addiction is not really effectively defined by how outside of the norm the behavior is. Uh, I am not interested in if, if somebody's in a, a couple and the coupleship likes to dress up like Hello Kitty and spank each other with silk whips and it is loving and affirming and it brings them closer together as a couple and it's mutually agreed upon. Go for it. Have a great time. Don't come to my office because y you're not the person I want to work with. However, if someone has something as inside the box as masturbation, but their masturbation is out of control, it's creating problems. Uh, in the extreme, it's creating physical uh, damage to themselves. Uh, it is significantly undermining uh, their relationship and their sexual relationship with their partner. Now we're going to have a whole different conversation. So when we're looking at whether something is an addiction or not, we're really looking for, does it match these criteria? And these are sort of the basic 10 criteria that we use for any addiction. We just tweak them to match sex addiction. So first of all, is the behavior out of control? Does the behavior have this sense of it, it, it's not contained, it, it's out of control, it, it, it's the, the, the person can't, contr uh, can't control it. How many times can I say control in one description? It's out of control. It's unmanageable for the person. Has it become compulsive? Has the behavior become, I feel like I have to do it and it's very difficult for me to pull back and, and, and contain that behavior, to not go there. It's become a very compulsive, knee-jerk type of behavior. Have they tried to stop and been unable to? Whether that is, I'm not going to uh, act out for um, a week. Uh, there was uh, a website out there for a while that had a challenge for people to not look at porn for 100 days. You would be surprised how many people walked in my office because they were unable to do that, even with a big reward they were trying to give themselves. Um, their partner might have uh, found out about their sexual behavior and said, I'm uncomfortable with this. Would you please not do it? And they agree, and yet they're unable to honor that agreement. All kinds of ways that they've tried to stop either with uh, agreements to themselves, to their partner, to God, uh, all kinds of different places, but they've been, they've tried to stop, but un been unable to. Do they lose time? Loss of time can be loss of time due to acting out. I, um, I was going to be online looking at porn for 20 minutes, and it's three hours later, and I'm still there. It can also be I've lost time because I spent excessive amounts of time preparing to act out. I spent two hours cruising up and down San Rosa Avenue looking for the prostitute. I've been driving around town and figuring out which massage parlor is the one that I want to try today. Or it can be lots, loss of time from recovering from sexually acting out. I was up, uh, I was up all night looking at porn. I'm exhausted. I went to work. I functioned poorly and now I am just dead tired and I've been sleeping for the last 12 hours. So have they lost time? Do they get preoccupied with it? Does it become that earworm that just stays in their head and they can't get away from it even when it's not an appropriate time to be engaging and embracing those uh, sexual thoughts or the ideas of that behavior? Are they unable or have they not fulfilled obligations that they were supposed to do? This might be the report that I was supposed to do, but I was acting out and so I didn't get the report done. This could be I was supposed to pick the kids up at the school and I was half an hour late because the massage parlor was right there on the way and I figured I could get a quickie. The, all kinds of ways that an uh, inability to fulfill an obligation shows up. Uh, the, my, my yard is a mess. I've been meaning to mow the lawn, but you know, I'd rather do this. Continuation despite consequences. Uh, many of the addicts that we work with have had significant consequences, lost jobs, lost relationships, financial uh, impacts from their, their acting out, um, lots, lots of lots of consequences. And regardless of the consequence and how bad it is, the person continues the behavior even though there are these major consequences. 
escalation. Escalation is sort of the sex addiction version of, um, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Tolerance, thank you, for tolerance with alcohol. Uh, with sex addiction, the easiest way I can describe this is that uh, sex addiction is about intensity. And so the sex addict needs the behavior to be more intense over time. And so the, the behavior, uh, if we take pornography as an example, initially um, looking at the lingerie ads were enough for me. And then I needed Playboy because the lingerie ads wouldn't do it. And then I needed Penthouse. And then I needed Hustler. And then I went online. And then I needed videos. And then the videos needed to go into more sort of extreme kind of video categories. Um, and so the escalation of the behavior continues over time. Uh, and it is not uncommon for escalation behavior to start online and move offline. Um, losses, they've had losses in their life, lost jobs, lost relationships, lost all kinds of things. And then lastly, withdrawal. Um, and withdrawal is the emotional withdrawal. They get uh, agitated, they get upset, they, they can't sleep, they sleep all the time. Um, there, there's a definite withdrawal that goes on for them. They just become irritable and grumpy and unhappy to be around if, uh, if they aren't able to act out. So when we're talking sex addiction, I'm not talking about any sexual behavior that someone says, I don't like that. We're talking about sexual behaviors that match cons these kind of criteria, and we look for a minimum of three criteria when we're, when we're looking at a sex addiction behavior. This is just a quick screening tool, and uh, I'm just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. There is a flyer in the back that has this on there, as well as some other information about Willow Tree. But Pathos is just a very quick screening tool that you can give to a client, and if they answer yes to any of these questions, it doesn't mean that they are definitely an addict, but it means that it, it's worth having a conversation with them about if sex addiction might be something going on for them. Um, preoccupied with sexual thoughts, hiding sexual behaviors from others, sought help for problematic sexual behavior. Uh, others have suffered due to their sexual behavior. They feel controlled by their sexual desire, and they feel depressed after sexual behavior or activities. We are so excited about this. The World Health Organization um, is putting sex addiction into their, well, it's not actually sex addiction. Compulsive sexual behavior is becoming a diagnosis in the new ICD. Um, and it is going under the compulsive behavior section to start with. This is the same pathway that gambling addiction took. Um, and so I'm thrilled about this. One of the things that it's going to allow is, since it will be in a formal diagnostic manual, that more research money will be available to look into it. Uh, I'm going to share a whole bunch of research with you today, and I'm expecting that over the next five years there's going to be even more. Uh, I have very little doubt that sex addiction is going to eventually follow the path of gambling addiction and end up in the addiction section of the manual. It's not there yet, regardless of uh, what we have seen clinically. But um, very excited about that. So Jeannie makes me do this slide. I'll blame her on this one. When we look at sex addicts, one of the things that we are very aware of is that sex addicts are not opportunivores, meaning that a sex addict is not going to go do any behavior that has to do with sex, sexual behavior, sexual energy that they can get away with at any time. So somebody who is looking at porn is not necessarily a person who's going to use a prostitute. Somebody who is um, exposing themselves is not going to be a child molester. So we are always looking at, well, what are the behaviors that are hooked into your sex addiction? And what we find as a rule of thumb is that addicts typically have at least three. And I'm just going to go over these very quickly. These are the different categories that we look at. What we find is that the behaviors for addicts can sort of be, you know, there are some addicts that, hey, this is their behavior, and it sort of fits within this category, which is a distinctly different category than others. One other thing I want to point out before I go through this is that 90 to 95% of these behaviors are perfectly normal, behaviors that can be healthy in a loving relationship in somebody's own sexual relationship. So because I'm talking about this behavior up here, it does not mean that if somebody is doing it, they're an addict, and it also does not mean that the behavior is problematic. If it meets the criteria that we talked about previously for sex addiction, then we're going to have a conversation about it. So fantasy is just having sexual fantasies in your head. Um, fantasies about, uh, fantasy and consequences, sexual fantasies in your head. Oh, what I was, okay. Um, sexual fantasies in your head, 
uh, fantasies about uh, pornography you viewed, uh, sexual behaviors you've done, uh, sexual behaviors you might be thinking about doing in the future, but it's sort of that fantasy element that, that takes over in your head. Pornography use is pretty straightforward, and that doesn't matter what medium it is. Uh, it might be online, it might be paper, uh, video, images, uh, erotica, but pornography. Networking for anonymous sex is using the internet to find people to be sexual with anonymously. These are people that are going on Craigslist or something and arranging to meet at a hotel to be sexual. No interest in, in seeing each other after that, no interest in a relationship, it's just a sexual liaison. Uh, swinging in group sex uh, is what it says. sounds like. It's a group sex, it's swinging, it's swapping partners, it's being sexual with more people or in, in a larger, uh, larger group of people. Cruising behavior is cruising uh, parks, uh, public restrooms, different places, trying to find someone to be sexual with anonymously. This is the in-person networking. Uh, relationship addiction is somebody who gets obsessed with relationships. We will see this in a couple of different ways. Um, this is the person who's in a relationship and regardless of how bad it is, they feel like they just can't leave. This is also the person who has multiple relationships, one right after another. Uh, this is also people that have uh, relationships concurrently. So people who are having uh, multiple ongoing affairs might have a relationship addiction piece going on. Conquest is the player. Conquest is the person who, whether or not they have sex with the other person, the real interest is, I am hooking you in so that you are interested in me. And getting you interested in me is where I get the high. Intrusive sex is crossing sexual boundaries. On the, the low extreme, this is somebody who's telling a lot of sexual jokes, always making the sexual innuendos, so the person who's always bringing sex into the conversations, uh, particularly at places that it may not be appropriate, or it might be sort of borderline appropriate. On the other extreme, it's people who are touching other people in public without their permission, or um, rape, forced sexual activity. Humiliation and domination is the emotional side of S&M. I am dominant, you are submissive. And the pain exchange is the physical side of S&M. Paying for sex commercial is using money to gain sexual access. I'm paying for a prostitute, I'm paying for a massage uh, that is sexual. Uh, I'm using money to gain sexual access to somebody else. Paying for sex power is I am using my position of power to gain sexual access with somebody else. Think about the boss having sex with their secretary, or I will help you in your uh, career if you're sexual with me. Um, if you remember the movie, I assume we all do, uh, Forrest Gump, it's the uh, school, in, school superintendent who had let Forrest into the school because mom had sex with him. Phone sex is pretty straightforward, using the phone, being sexual, having sexual conversations. I think sexting fits under there these days. Uh, voyeurism and covert intrusions, uh, it's getting visual stimulation from other people. That might be uh, somebody who's a peeping Tom, and the covert intrusion comes in with people sometimes will sneak into other people's houses, uh, hide in uh, closets or under stairs or different places to hope to see them naked or being engaged in sexual activity. Exhibitionism is exhibiting yourself and getting a sexual high from that, whether that is uh, overt, such as a stripper or somebody who's being paid for that, or, you know, uh, stripping for your partner, which can be a beautiful thing. Or if it is more covert, I'm wearing outfits that are very uh, ex exhibiting of myself, and it may not be as obvious to other people the, the hit that I'm getting while I'm out in public. Exploitive sex trust, I'm taking advantage of a trusting relationship. Uh, to be sexual with somebody, that's clinicians who are sexual with clients or patients, um, people who are in charge of uh, developmentally disabled or geriatric patients being sexual with them, taking advantage of a, of a trusting relationship to be sexual. Exploitive sex with children is, is child abuse, uh, child molestation, uh, and that may be uh, actually being sexual with them, and it might just be exposing them to sexual material and sexual information. Uh, drug interaction, I'm combining drugs with my sexual addiction to get a bigger high. Uh, typically this either happens in one of three ways. I'm using drugs to lower my inhibitions so it's easier to act out. 
I am combining drugs with my sexual acting out so I get a bigger high, or I feel such guilt after acting out sexually that I'm using drugs to numb myself out. Object sex is using objects uh, for sexual gratification, vibrators, dildos, artificial vaginas, those kind of things. Home produced pornography is I'm creating pornography for myself um, or to share with other people, but I'm producing it. That might be taking pictures of myself for other people. It might be taking videos of myself for other people. It might be writing erotica. And then masturbation is pretty straightforward. And I just want to circle back and say, again, I share this with you just to let you know these are the different categories and the breadth of the sexual behaviors that we're looking at and that we actually see in our office, although we don't do offender work. Uh, I will say that. Um, but again, the vast majority of these behaviors can be very healthy within a relationship. And so it is not just a, an issue of if this behavior is something that they're doing, that they are an addict and they should come in and do some work. It's really does the behavior match the criteria for an addiction? Does it have an addictive pattern attached to it as opposed to is the behavior simply there? So trauma underlies sex addiction. And sexually addictive behaviors are often an, uh, an expression of the underlying trauma. So for example, uh, if I have a straight man who is acting out with other men, it is not uncommon that as a child he was molested and what he is acting out with other men is a direct recreation of the trauma from his childhood that he's trying unconsciously to resolve. Um, the, he, you know, and sometimes the question comes up of, is he gay? Is he straight? Is, is this really a, a sexual orientation issue? And it's sort of the easy answer, that, the easy way to screen that is, well, when you're acting out, are you really attracted to this person or are they just a penis for you to get off on? And if there's an attraction there, there's probably a sexual orientation issue. If it's, it's just a penis to get off on, it's usually a trauma issue underneath that they're trying to resolve. But trauma shows up underneath. If I've got somebody who, uh, as a teenager, was very awkward, didn't feel like they were uh, able to sort of connect with, with girls and always felt like they were on the outskirts and relationships and sort of putting themselves out there wasn't safe, they're probably going to be somebody who's looking at porn at home with the curtains closed in the privacy of their own home where they're not, you know, putting themselves out there where they could be rejected. Porn doesn't reject you. So sex addiction is typically an expression of underlying trauma. That's changing a little bit more recently with, uh, with the Internet and with a lot of teenagers whose introduction to sex is online and then their primary sexual behaviors are online. You know, we'll talk about sort of the neuroplasticity and the changes in the brain. Trauma creates one avenue where that behavior continues and sort of gets wired in there. But just the ongoing internet sexual behavior a lot can also do that even without the obvious underlying trauma. So I assume that this is obvious. There are two kinds of trauma, big T trauma, little t trauma. We see both of them with sex addicts. Some sex addicts have been uh, overtly abused as children or as adults, uh, and some sex addicts are more relationally uh, traumatized and are carrying that relational trauma with them. I have some gentlemen that walk into my office during the uh, assessment, and I'll say, well, let's t tell me about your, your family. And they'll tell me, well, you know, my family was wonderful. And I've been doing this enough work, work long enough that I'm kind of jaded now, and I just think to myself, okay, another fantasy to shatter. Um, but, you know, and it's not that their family didn't love them, but it, typically I don't think anybody gets out of their family without some sort of relational trauma, and it just shows up in different ways. And if they're coming in my office, there's something there. The ACEs study, I just want to put this up there because one of the things that the ACEs study showed us is that trauma in childhood has a significant ongoing impact for uh, everyone, for adults, as they move on in life. And, and I think that the ACEs study and the continue, continued work that's being done on the ACEs study is a wonderful example of how trauma impacts people in all kinds of ways that we may not have expected. Alan Shore, in 2001, also did some work on trauma, children who were traumatized and what they found out. And, and what his research showed was that not only are there behavioral impacts on trauma that show up for people later on in life, uh, 
but there's actual neurological impacts on their brains. Their brains are, get wired differently if they've gone through traumatic events as a child. So trauma has a significant impact on us neurologically, behaviorally, and for many sex addicts, it leads to sex addiction. So this is just a quick sort of run through of the trauma, um, neurological process of trauma. I'm assuming that this makes sense, but I'll walk through it very quickly. So there's an actual perceived threat, causes stress hormones and neurotransmitters to be released into the nervous system. Stress hormones and neurotransmitters, they're designed for action. I'm gonna protect myself. Fight, flight, freeze. There's a new one out there. C connect? Collapse. Uh, the survival part of the brain, uh, yeah, fight, f fight, flight, freeze. And then here's the part that I'm always most interested in. The prefrontal cortex slows down, goes offline to conserve resources. And then the prefrontal cortex, all the stuff in the front of our brain, which contains the executive abilities such as memory, logical reason, and behavior inhibitor, inhibitors, goes offline. And that's really important to understand with sex addicts. And I'll, I'll get back to that in just a bit. And the triggers that can set this off can be external and can be obvious, and they can be internal and subtle. And so with my sex addicts, I have a lot of them that will have um, you know, overt reactions. I was uh, somewhere, and uh, I was walking through the mall, and we were walking by Victoria's Secret, and there was all the advertisements up there, and it just got the stuff going in my head, and I couldn't get rid of it, and I acted out later that night. But I'll also have people that come in, and they're, and, and, like I had one gentleman who came in, and he said, okay, so I relapsed over the weekend, but I, I, I don't quite understand it. Let me talk to you about it. And what turned out to be happening is that his wife had, done, had done, headed down to San Francisco for a girls' weekend. Now, he and his wife are in a very good space in their relationship at this time. You know, and the wife was uh, going down with friends. They weren't going to be doing any wild, outlandish, you know, relationally inappropriate stuff down there. And he knew that. And yet, when his wife headed out for the city, what he had said to me was, I felt this abandonment wound in my gut. And it just was overwhelming, and I couldn't get rid of it, and eventually he relapsed. And so it wasn't an overt sexual cue that set his addiction in place. It was a relational cue. It was an internal experience that hit the abandonment that he'd experienced emotionally from his parents growing up. So trauma triggers for sex addicts show up in all kinds of ways, and it sort of pushes that behavior as it goes. So here's what we see. So you have big T trauma or relational trauma. And then the addict has this attempt to try to manage that traumatic experience. Because they don't know what they're overwhelmed with it and their brain is like, we need to survive. And so they go to their sexual behavior because their behavior is gonna numb out that experience and that's what they're trying to do. And they continue to repeatedly do that behavior over and over again, because they're trying to survive this, this trauma experience that happened. Because their brain can't tell the difference between internal and external. It can't tell the difference between life-threatening and just overwhelming emotional. And over time, those repetitive high emotion behaviors create neurological changes in the brain. And those neurological changes in the brain lead the addictive behavior that the person has started using to become more of an ingrained neurological pattern, which reinforces the trauma. So, trauma creates neurological distress for the addicts. And so the addicts are using their addictive behavior to try to manage it. And so as that trauma gets triggered overtly, covertly, over time, that addictive behavior that started out as a coping tool as a t teenager or younger, typically, has become more ingrained as a neurological survival tool that the brain goes to when it gets trauma, when that trauma reaction gets hit. And this is my other favorite one. The frontal cortex goes offline. So the logical reasoning goes out the window. So addictive justification gets activated. And this is where I hear some of my favorite stories. 
I, I, you know, I figured if I didn't have an orgasm, it wasn't really masturbation. Well, you know, if I'm not using my hands, then it's not really masturbation. Well, you know, if I'm outside of the 150-mile radius, I'm outside of where the wedding vows really are, are enforceable. Uh, I recently heard one, the first two sexual liaisons don't count. Uh, and, and then one of my favorites of all time, I had a gentleman who um, convinced himself, if I'm not looking directly at the monitor, then I'm not looking at porn. And he spent an entire week acting out by looking at the porn on his monitor in a mirror. And when we hear all of these stories... To us, it sounds crazy. And when the addict, sort of their brain comes back online and they're solid, solid and grounded and they're telling us these stories, they're like, yeah, that really makes no sense, does it? I'm like, no. But in the moment when that trauma wound gets triggered and their brain says, I need this behavior in order to survive, and their frontal cortex goes offline and says, okay, what can we do to make that behavior more palatable for you? And you're going to hear all of these addictive justifications that, 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 that make no sense. One of the things that we do right off the bat is we t start educating addicts about denial. And what are your denial mechanisms and how are you justifying this? And how is that absolutely false? And we have to do that because they have to learn to counteract the trauma reaction of what's going on in their brain. So neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity, you have this trauma reaction that you learn to use these behaviors, you do it over time, repeated, really repeatedly, and the brain over time wires itself to, to, to change. Does, does that make sense to everybody? Because I can tell you my favorite story about neuroplasticity. Okay, I, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna tell it to you because I like it. So um, MIT, pretty sure it was MIT, might have been Harvard, one of the two, uh, did some studies back in two, early 2000s, 2001 or so. They brought people into a room, they taught them a pattern on a musical keyboard, measured with MRIs the parts of their brain that were dedicated to the finger movements, sent them home, said, for three weeks we want you to practice that pattern on the keyboard for 15 minutes every day, brought them back, and the ch brain had dedicated more of itself to the finger movements. The brain changes with repeated behaviors. Here's the second part to it, which I love even better. I took a second group of people in, taught them the exact same pattern on the keyboard, sent them home and they said, we don't want you to touch a musical keyboard for f the next three weeks. We don't want e you to even move your fingers and pretend that you're playing a musical keyboard for three weeks. But what we want you to do is sit for 15 minutes every day and just think. Just think about that pattern on the musical keyboard, brought them back and their brains had changed in the exact same way. The brain can't tell the difference between what happens outside and what happens inside. And so when it comes to working with addicts, that's one of the things that we do a lot of work on. And you have to start taking responsibility for the fantasies in your head. Because if you don't, the fantasies in your head are interfering with the neurological healing we're trying to create for you. So neuroplasticity is the cause of sex addiction. Kind of. There's more to it, but that's a simple one. So... With sex addiction, there, there, there's been a lot of studies on what's neurologically going on. Hilton and Watts, 2011, found that there was actual brain atrophy in different sections of the brain for people who are identified as having sex addiction as compared to normal, non-addict brains. Valerie Voon, I love this study. Uh, a medical community came to her and said, hey, we want you to do some study on is sex addiction actually a thing? And she said, yeah, I don't think it's a thing, but sure, I'll... You can pay me and I'll, I'll do this and we'll see. And she did the research and came back and said, yeah, no, it, this is a thing. And what she found was that uh, there were parts of the brain, the reward network, that became hyperactive to porn and correlated with people who reported themselves as being addicts. Uh, Michael Munn in 2014 increased attentional bias to sexually explicit cues. The brain lit up when addicts were shown sexually explicit cues significantly more than people who weren't addicts. Uh, and also in 2014, uh, Kuhn and Galanat, I'm gonna go with that pronunciation, 
um, found that there were actual neurological changes in both the structure of the brain as well as the function of the brain. So neuroplasticity with the trauma or with just repeated behavior online sort of tweaks and rewires the brain and actually we're finding actual neurological wiring functional differences in the brain of people who are identified as sex addicts. So when we talk about sex addiction, we're not talking a behavior disorder. We're not talking, hey, this behavior is problematic. What we're talking about is this behavior is problematic because the brain underneath that's driving it has rewired itself. And if we're going to help you actually make changes, we have to help the brain to rewire. So the neurological changes in the brain, the addict gets preoccupied with sexually addictive behaviors and images, or, and they have impaired behavioral containment. I describe it this way. Addicts think they're driving around in a neurological sports car. They think, I can corner quickly, I can stop on a dime, I can accelerate, I can, I am in control. This thing can corner on rails. And in reality, they're driving around in a neurologically loaded moving van. They're going to try to take a corner quick and they're going to overshoot it because of the weight of what's going on. They're going to try to hit the brakes and stop and they're going to overshoot and end up in the middle of the intersection at best. And they're going to they're going to have that idea of, hey, I want to do this or this looks like a good idea or there's a sexual cue and their brain's going to grab onto it and pull them there and then they're not going to be able to contain themselves. And that's what we see neurologically. And that's not just that they make bad choices. It's neurologically their brain can't do it any better. If they don't understand that, they're going to have a lot of problems. There are actual neurological pathways in the brain that stimulate the pleasure center. The stimulation pathway, which is arousal, thrill-seeking. The satiation pathway, which is sort of um, numbing or soothing. The fantasy pathway altering or denying rea reality, and then the, what's the last one, De deprivation, which is pushing away or extreme avoiding. S looking for the high, looking for the calm, looking for the escape, looking for the control. With typical addictions, we're, we're looking at cocaine, high-risk activities, gambling for stimulation. Alcohol, overeating, depressant drugs for satiation, marijuana, psychedelics for, for uh, the uh, fantasy, and deprivation is anorexia. When you get people that are in recovery from multiple addictions, you will consistently hear them say that sex addiction is the hardest one to kick because sex runs along all four of those pathways. And so the brain of a sex addict is a little bit more neurologically hooked in than even a drug or, or, an, or an over, uh, somebody with an eating disorder. So neuroplasticity is the problem. Fortunately, neuroplasticity is also the cure. So what do we do? Get sober, stay sober, and do the trauma work. You will hear some people that do sex addiction work that flip this. Uh, I personally disagree with them, and I'm right. Um, <laughs> here, here's the problem. Your brain has been wired to um, manage the uncomfortable experiences and that trauma reaction comes up to kick the addiction in to manage when you feel overwhelmed. If someone walks in your office and you're digging into their trauma right out the bat, trauma work is uncomfortable. And they haven't learned the skills to stay sober yet. And so if I dig into the trauma right off the bat, I'm setting them up to relapse. And if I'm setting them up to relapse, their behavior is going to reinforce the addictive neural programming in their brain, which is going to get in the way of the changes that the client is coming to me to get. So while we recognize that trauma is there and it's very important to do that trauma work, we're going to put it on the backside because I have to help them figure out how to get sober, how to stay sober, and how to have the tools to manage that emotional upset without relapsing so that their behavior stops reinforcing the neurological wiring of their brain. I assume that makes sense. So when we're talking 
neurology and trying to heal the neurological stuff in their brain, you know, in the get sober section, we're educating them about red flags of their addiction. If I can educate them about the red flags of their addiction, it's going to be easier for them to avoid them. If instead of walking into the middle of an addictive trigger, if they can start to see, oh, yeah, no, I'm starting to feel this, it's going to be easier for them to kick their program in and make changes. We're trying to get them to make their behavioral change before the neurological process kicks in full force. Identify their middle circle behaviors. Middle circle behaviors in sex addiction are gray area behaviors. It may not be a relapse, but it's definitely problematic. Um, uh, it is, uh, I'm not having an affair, but I had lunch with my affair partner. It's not, I'm looking at porn, but now I'm looking at not porn. Um, not porn is sexually charged images that, I, that the addict can justify as not really being pornographic. Um, and again, if I can get them to recognize, hey, these early things that are coming up, it's going to be easier for them to change their behavior. And by changing their behavior, we're rewiring their brain. Develop sobriety tools. If they can start using their sobriety tools to stay sober and change their behavior, it rewires their brain. I'm going to be in broken record here for a bit. Rewires their brain. Educate about the neurology of addiction and trauma. I want them to understand what's going on in their brain, why things are difficult, what we can do to help them make that changes, and why the work that we're doing is so important, not just behaviorally and relationally, but neurologically for them. Create and maintain a recovery routine. The more that I can help them be grounded, and we typically have guys meditating, journaling, exercising, making phone calls, checking on how the day went, but anything they can do to keep themselves more grounded, which is going to help them to change their behavior and maintain those behavioral changes over time, it's going to be more helpful. Create and connect with others. When your brain is broken and when your brain isn't working, if you're trying to manage your recovery and sobriety on your own, you're going to fail. However, if I call someone up and say, you know, I was thinking that if I look at the, mo at, at, at the monitor of my computer in a mirror, that I'm not really looking at porn, other people are going to go, yeah, we should grab a cup of coffee. So we need other people to start helping them. Follow the advice and guidance from others. Borrow their brain when your brain is not working. And if I can get an addict to understand, oh, my brain is broken, and the neurology stuff in here is going on, so I need to let other people guide me instead of me trying to do this, we're going to have more, more help. Uh, and then lastly, consistently and independently use trauma tools. The more that they do that to manage their trauma and heal their trauma, the less behavior of their addiction continues on. And again, we change that brain. From a trauma perspective, I'm educating about the early red flags. Because if I educate about the early red flags, we're slowly allowing their brain to heal and they're not recreating that trauma. And over time, it will lessen. We're developing sobriety tools. Again, not reinforcing the trauma patterns that they've been doing. Educate about the, uh, not only neurology, but about trauma. Here's what's going on in your brain. Here's why you need to do this. Here's why, if you're just trying to do this on your own, chances are you're not going to be successful consistently. Stay sober. All of that stuff is helpful for the addict with healing their trauma as well. And then formal trauma work. I usually start out with the guys doing post-induction therapy, which is an uh, inner child-based tr four-day trauma workshop. It does a great job of sort of taking a land mover and removing the topsoil and saying, here's what's really underneath. Let's start working on it. But we also do trauma resource management. I, I got trained in EMDR recently, which I'm finding wonderful. Uh, but we're always going in and doing that, that work. So we're doing the formal work. We're integrating the, the trauma work into their individual therapy. We're developing you know, their awareness of, oh, my trauma wound is getting triggered, and now let me do something about that, rather than going with it. So we're doing a lot of work to, over time, heal their trauma so that those wounds don't continue to drive the addiction. So we're trying to create a baseline. We're trying to create you know, a shift in behavior and community, not just to change the addictive behaviors, but to help them heal their brain and to heal those neurological trauma wounds that are going on. One thing that you can do is you can have a support daily to remind them of that. Remind them of that. I have a book that's going to be published next week that is a daily meditation book for sex addicts. 
And what I love about this book, or what I'm most excited about this book, is not only does it have a uh, 12-step wisdom in it, but it also has a lot of information from a, a therapeutic perspective. It also has a lot of information on partner sensitivity in it. And so it's got a, a really nice therapeutic wraparound that can be a positive guide for uh, addicts who are in recovery and trying to figure out how to do those changes. So neurologically, with sex addiction, we're not just looking at behaviors. We're looking at what's going on neurologically and everything that we're doing. While we might be talking about community, we might be talking about behaviors, we might be talking about brown boundaries, everything that we're doing with the addict at Willow Tree is through the lens of we're healing your brain. I think you're up. Oh, sure, Let's do real quick. No, I've got this one. No, this is. Do you here. generally start with the group and then go to individual, or do you start with into, we like for the getting sober, staying sober, and then the sure. time work? We we typically do an assessment because first thing we want to make sure is that actually that there's an addiction pattern going on, uh, and so we're verifying that up front, and we're also gathering a, a thorough history. After the assessment, typically they're starting with us individually. And as soon as they are appropriate, we are pulling them into a therapeutic group. Um, I also recommend that all of our guys are also involved in community support groups like Sex Addicts Anonymous, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. So most of the people working with us are doing individual, they're doing group, and they're also attending community support groups. Uh, Pat Carnes, who's one of the gurus of sex addiction stuff, did a lot of research and found that the addicts that had the best, uh, ha had the most consistent successful sobriety and recovery had individual therapy, group therapy, 12-step stuff. We have found that to be absolutely true. 